Thank you, Fred. Just in case you didn't notice, uh, <laughs> Pastor Bickle isn't here, um, but we're still here. We're here to meet, to worship, and to uh, get to know our Lord. Well, let's, uh, let's pray first before we dig into the Word, and then after that we will dig right in, all right? God, thank you very much for allowing us again the opportunity to meet and Lord I pray that you would speak through me your words would go forth uh, not mine your will would be accomplished Lord we want you to meet with us and uh, we want to hear from you we want to hear your words and so I pray that you would speak through me and speak to all of us that our hearts would be in tune and our hearts would be open God, there might be some that are tuning in that don't know you. Maybe some that have been coming to church for years. Maybe some who have um, never even been to church and somebody told them about this and they're just tuning in. Lord, I pray that you would work in their hearts and uh, open their eyes to who you are. It's a work that you do. And it's not a convincement on our part, but it's you speaking to them and revealing to them their sin and their need for you. Lord, those of us who are your children, I pray that you would teach us and reveal to us things that we need to apply to our lives. That you would be given all the glory. You would be the one who's glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All right, so there is a very popular verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It is verse 31. And if you know it, say it along with us. All right, whether you're here or at home, you can say it along. It's very short, very simple, and most of you probably have it memorized. Ready? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all for the glory of God. Very good. A lot of us know that verse. A lot of us have quoted that verse. A lot of us have um, perhaps enjoyed that verse and used it, needed it in our lives at a specific time, that no matter what we do, we need to do it for God's glory. And it, it, it even uses stuff that seems to be simple, everyday type things, whether therefore you eat or even drink. Do even those things for the glory of God. Stuff that everyone has to do normally every day. Um, some of us might fast or something like that or um, try to lose weight so we, we stop eating. But you get the point, right? It's something that we do all the time. I want us to look a little more at the context around the one verse to kind of get a, an even more specific uh, application of that verse all right yes whatever we do needs to be for the glory of God I think we are all in agreement to that but let's look at it in the context as well to even see more specifically how we can apply it if you have been tuning in uh, the past the past time I spoke uh, a few weeks back it was about I won't quiz you uh, maybe you slept or maybe you didn't tune in it was uh, about relationships, right? And if somebody uh, does something, you can go to them and, and tell them what they did, and then they need to ask forgiveness, and then what is our responsibility to go back to them and forgive? And so we discussed that a few weeks back. I want to continue with the theme of relationships even tonight. And very specifically, it's going to be in regards to relationships with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. With those of you around you, right? Or virtually around you. Those people that you, you see, you get together with in normal circumstances once a week or twice a week or... Uh, different times, whether it's fellowships or gatherings or, or hanging out at their house, right? With those brothers and sisters in the Lord, 
I want us to see how these relationships need to take place, right? It's very specific for that kind of relationship. So we're going to dig into this. Now, 1 Corinthians, really Corinthians, but in 1 Corinthians, you see that this church has problems, all right? You, you never can read the, the book of Corinthians or, or 2 Corinthians and think, wow, this church is like perfect. Uh, they're stellar. They have no issues. No, really, as you're reading through the, the books of the Corinthians, you see that these, this church is made up of a bunch of sinners. A lot like our church, right? A bunch of sinners, forgiven, gathering together, worshiping the same God who's forgiven us. And we got problems too. This church had problems. There was division. There was strife. There were issues of uh, sin that they were putting up with, like it was no big deal. Like, oh, it's okay. That immorality is fine, even though the world would even look at that immorality and find it absolutely appalling. The church was totally accepting, right? There were issues. Paul even had to address believers taking other believers to court, right? There was strife and, and difficulty going on in, in this body, in this church, and Paul is having to address it. So, in chapter 8, we're not going to take the time to read the whole chapter, there is a discussion in regards to what you do in the eyes of your brother, right? And it has to do with meat sacrificed to idols. Now, that's a very good application for them specifically in, in that day. So uh, we're going to look at what that is for them. Obviously, we don't really have that problem, right? None of us, I would assume, are having the issue of, should I eat this... Uh, should I eat this steak today because I know that it's been offered to a, a stone statue, right? And everybody's going to be offended if they see me eating that. We're not going to have that issue. When we go to BJ's and we pick up a big packet of meat, we're not worried about did, did this lamb get slaughtered at the foot of, uh, you know, some idol. We normally aren't worried about such a thing. But at Corinth, they were having these issues, right? People would eat the meat sacrificed by idols, and believers who were stronger in the Lord knew that they had liberty to eat it. They had knowledge in the Lord, in God's word, and who he was, that, hey, I can eat this meat, and there are no issues with that. I am not at all sinning against God by eating this meat. On the other side, there were some believers in the church who were immature. Maybe they were newly saved out of idol worship, and they associated in their mind, hey, me eating this meat is, is me agreeing to, to worshiping this idol. I don't understand. Why would you believers eat that? You don't, you don't worship the idol. And they didn't get it. And to them, it was causing a stumbling block to them. It was offensive to them. And a, a mature believer is doing this, and it might even encourage them to start eating when in faith they were not doing it. They were not eating in faith. They were sinning against their, even their own conscience. They were having a hard time with this. How can I eat this meat? So that was a, a difficulty that Paul is addressing. Look, if you're a mature believer and, and it, it bothers this other person for you to eat the meat, don't eat the meat. Give it up. Just all right, hey, this bothers you? I have liberty in the Lord to eat this meat. No problem. I can, eat, I can eat this steak. I can fire up the grill and throw it on. No problems between me and the Lord. But that other person was really struggling because it was a problem for them. So Paul says, just give it up. Yeah, you might have the knowledge that this is okay, but a lot of times, knowledge makes us arrogant. So instead, we take the knowledge and we apply it 
in love. All right, so that is a background in chapter 8. So now we're coming to chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth, another's benefit. So first off, we are not to look to ourselves, but to others. Anything and everything we do, it's not about us. We need to take into thought, how is this for others? Does this help these that see me? Does it benefit others around me? Or am I caring less about who sees, who knows, and it's, you know, I'm just going to do it and have at it. Paul makes the point here. God is teaching us, hey, whatever you do, do for someone else's benefit, not for yours. It's about them. And you take that idea into our body, into our, our church, right? Let everything you do, whether you're coming together to worship the Lord, whether you're uh, taking an opportunity to serve, whether there's a, a, an issue or a difference between you and someone else, or you have to bring up a, or correct something, it should always be for the other person's benefit. Right? And now he goes back to this meat example. So we see in verse 25, So whatsoever is sold in the shambles, all right? What is the shambles, all right? It's whatever sold in the marketplace, okay? Whatever is being sold in this marketplace in the meat market, eat it, asking no question for conscience sake. And why? Why can you eat whatever meat is being sold, whether it's been sacrificed to an idol or not? Why can you eat it? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So it doesn't matter. You go to the marketplace. Don't, don't be asking around, saying, is this sacrifice to idols? You don't know. You go, you buy the meat, and you know as a believer, it doesn't matter. Okay? So you just buy it and you eat it. God made it. You can have it. Enjoy it. You're not worshiping an idol. You're just having a steak. Okay? But, another situation. If, verse 27, any of them that believe not bid you to a feast. So an unbeliever invites you over to their house and you be disposed to go. Whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Once again, it's for conscience sake. Now we're going to talk about um, the conscience of, of, in a second in regards to this conscience sake. But verse 28, so now you're at the meal, you're at this person's house, the meat is set before you, no issues whatsoever, you know you can eat whatever meat there is, right? But if any man say unto you, hey, this steak, this, this steak here is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not, don't eat this, for the sake of that immature believer that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, verse 29, I say, not of your own, but of the other person. So you're sitting down to eat at this unbeliever's house that invited you over. They throw a piece of steak at you. You're ready to dive in. Another believer who is there and, and for them, it's, they, they can't eat anything offered to idols. It bothers them. It's against, against their conscience, right? That, that believer says, hey, um, did you know that that steak was just offered to an idol? You, you don't want to eat that. Now, that mature believer could look and say, dude, I can eat this. 
mind your business and go on about it and devour it. And he's not doing anything wrong in eating this steak. This steak can be consumed. But he's doing wrong because he's hurting the other brother. The other brother is being hurt because he thinks, I can't eat this, and it's bothering him. And it could even lead him, like I said earlier, to eat it, not in faith, and against his own conscience, and it's a sin for him. It's a stumbling block for him. And it's pulling him down. So Paul is saying, look, you, mature believer, I'm not wanting you to change your thinking to be like, oh yeah, I can't eat the meat sacrificed to idols. No! It's not that the thinking needs to be changed, just his actions need to be changed. In regards to this situation, hey, I need to put aside the meat. You don't, you know, my brother here is going to be offended. I just won't eat meat. Maybe you tell the host, hey, I'm good on the meat. I'll just take the salad, right? Even if you are like me and you really like steak. And if you're like me, you really like to eat, right? And if I see a delicious steak on the table, oh, it looks so good. I'm ready to dive in. And some guy across the table from me is like, Psst, you don't want to eat that. <laughs> yes, I do. Right? It's right there. I'm ready to dive in. Now, am I going to love myself and my belly more than that brother across the table? Or am I willing to put aside me for my brother. That's the important part. It's putting aside me for him. And Paul then asks these questions. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Why am I now supposed to live because of this other person? Because of the way they view it. Right? Isn't that a lot of times our fleshly response? You know? I have a right to eat this steak. I don't care that it bothers you. I am legally allowed to eat this steak. Right? That's really like the, the American in us coming out. I have rights. That steak is mine. And I'm diving in. You weak brother, you need to go read your Bible. You can eat that steak. Right? But no. My actions are now being judged not by just my conscience, not by what I say is right, but even in regards to offending my brother or my sister. It's not easy. Not easy at all. For if by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Why, why is this person able to speak bad of me or slander me? Why am I being slandered? I, I can eat this meat. I gave thanks for it because it's for the other person. So let all that you do not be done for yourself, but for others with them in mind all about the other person hmm well here we go now our verse whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do do it for the glory of God and you're glorifying God not just by your specific actions or what you know to be right and wrong and you obeying God that way but you also bring glory to God by not offending your brother. Your actions are pleasing to the Lord because you have the other person in mind. You could have eaten that steak just fine, but now eating it 
would not give glory to God because it would have hurt the other person. So now your desire is to love that other person. And in loving them more than yourself, you're giving God the glory. Even if it's something like eating or drinking. Even in something like that. Minuscule in, in, in one's mind. Something that everyone does all the time. Even in something like that, you do it with the other person's interests in mind. And that gives glory to God. Isn't that the purpose of gathering together to worship? Oh, I've come to worship today to give glory to God. It's not just in the singing. It's not just in sitting and listening to preaching. It's not just in, um, you know, the prayer time. You're giving glory to God in your interaction with each other by showing preference to the other person. By putting others and their interests and their needs ahead of your own. Man, I didn't eat breakfast. You know, it's Sunday morning back in pre-corona days when we had food, right? Sunday morning, I didn't eat because, you know, I got up late, got to rush out get to church and you know first service is over and you know there's the lunch line i am hungry right one of those nice ladies in the church cooked something that smells delicious not sandwiches right it was something real <laughs> sorry just kidding right it was one of those meals that you could smell or maybe you saw somebody walk in with it you know and it's in there. And you know it's sitting in there. And you're ready. You're ready to get right in line and get whatever that was. What happens? Before you make it to line, somebody says, Oh, hi. How are you? <laughs> I, was, I was doing good until you stopped me from getting into line. And you want to you wanna mosey on over to the line, right? Kind of kind of like almost pulling the person but maybe that person doesn't eat or they don't stay for the second service and you're like hey come on, just like at least stand in a line with me man and they're not moving <laughs> they're not, that's right that's right he does yeah anyway so that's right. they didn't the people online didn't hear what you said probably but that's okay. So you really want to just get in line because your belly is telling you, feed me. But that other person is actually interested and perhaps has had a really bad week. And they are just looking for someone to talk to, to share something with, to just lay it out. How do we give glory to God when we're at church, when we're fellowshipping to each other, with each other? It's not just by singing. Not just by listening to preaching. But you know what it is? It's putting others first. And that means even if I'm at the very end of the lunch line. Or by the time I get in there, there's nothing left. But maybe a couple barbecue chips. Right? And it's too late to go to the Chinese restaurant next door. And you've used up your whole lunch time listening to someone. But you know what? You give glory to God by stopping and listening to them because you're putting their needs first. And that's what matters. It's putting the other person first. And you know what? And then he goes on to explain it. Putting other people first in regards to situations, in regards to the way they, they look, the way they feel about, uh, look at certain situations or feel about certain, certain situations, things in which they perhaps think is sin. And, and we're told here, God says, give none offense. It doesn't matter to who it is, whether it's a Jewish person or a Gentile person or even to a believer. Unsaved Jewish person, unsaved Gentile or to your fellow believers. It doesn't matter. Don't give offense to any of them. Paul says here in verse 33, even as I please all men in all things. It doesn't mean that Paul was just, you know, like a politician trying to please everybody. That's not what, it, what, what, what he's saying. 
He's saying, I do things with, with all other people's interests at heart. If it offends them, I give it up. Right? If, if I'm spending time with the Jewish people and I'm going to eat kosher, I eat kosher. Right? If I'm spending time with the Gentiles and there's something that uh, might offend them or bother them, I'm going to give it up. Right? Paul is saying, look, I will do all of this. And why? Why is he willing to do all of this? Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved, that they might be delivered. My goal is for that person. Not just temporal needs, but spiritual needs, eternal needs. I'm doing this for them because I want them right with God. And that's my heart's desire. Whose example is, is, is this like Paul's example? I know we have chapter breaks and verse breaks, but take verse 1 of chapter 11 and attach it right here at the end. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Do just like I'm doing in this, in this case because we're just following Christ's example. We're doing just like Messiah Jesus did. He put others' needs before himself. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm telling you as a church to do. Put each other first. Don't think of yourself more highly than the other person. But put their needs, their desires, uh, things that they look at as, as a sin, put, put that aside. Put your liberty to the side for their sake. And in doing so, you're going to give God the glory. It's about building that relation, using our relationships, and we want to point everything to God. The brother is more important than me. Let's pray. God, thank you very much for our church. I am so grateful for this body that you've given us. Lord, it is, it is just amazing. And we really are blessed. But Lord, we're a bunch of sinners. And oftentimes, we all want to satisfy our desires that we would be gratified. May you change our hearts that we would look to each other. We would see each other's needs. We would put each other before ourselves. That you would receive the glory. That you would receive the honor because it's only done by you and through you. And it's only something that can be done for you. So, Lord, we want you to have our lives. We want you to have our church, that we would be unified and just centered around you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to 464.